Hey everyone, it's LS, and this is going to be the patch 10.13 notes rundown. As with the last couple of patches, I am really worried going into this patch because I'm mostly concerned that there's not going to be a whole bunch of changes, and that if there are changes, then it'll either end up just killing something without putting something new into it, or alternatively, um, the, the changes will just be like filler. So, buffed. We're going to have Nar, Kog'Maw, Lucian, Nocturne, Nunu, Rakan, Rise, Vi, and Yorick. And on the nerf side, we have Aphelios, Cassiopeia, Callista, Orn, Syndra, and Yumi. This is obviously a byproduct of probably competitive play, I'm assuming, for the Aphelios, Orn, and Syndra. And then obviously Callista on the chopping block, Yumi as well, has been one of the staples to be complained about a lot lately, so... Um, first, first impressions about this is that I believe I know what the Kog'Maw buffs are. Uh, I think that I've seen them talked about elsewhere, but I'm looking forward to seeing them. I have no idea how they can go about trying to buff Lucian. They always do have to be a little bit careful with that, given his presence in mid and top lane, but he is in an extremely bad spot right now. Nocturne and Nunu is very interesting, as is Yorick. Vi is another interesting one, but there's so many dittos of her that really exist right now inside of the jungle that I imagine it's going to be very hard to make her effective. Pool Party Syndra, Heimerdinger, Jarvan the Fourth, Pool Party Oriana, and Pool Party Talia. Okay, well. Um, champions. So I'm really worried about this. Base attack damage growth decreased. Q chakram reset removed from uh, epic monsters. Turret range indicators are no longer visible in the spectator. Okay. Um, attack damage growth is down by 0.2, so that doesn't really do a whole bunch. Q crescendum, the chakram, no longer resets the duration of chakram on epic monsters. Turret range indicators no longer show in spectator mood. Our moonlight vigil. Follow up attack, uh, a follow up attack crit, 50% bonus attack damage to 20% bonus attack damage. So, because they're not actually impacting what is making Aphilio strong. I don't think this is not going to move him. This will harm him a little bit, but what's making Aphilio strong right now is the fact that he has he's he's chameleon from Mortal Kombat. He has Ash and Varus's ultimate on his purple ability, the Gravitum. He has Caitlyn's range. He has the ability to shred through turrets, equivalent to like Jinx or Tristana. He has a hyper carries damage when the opponents all come in short range, and he just unloads everything onto the opponents, depending on what his gun setup is. So the thing is, is that Apelios, he has so many tools inside of his kit, and a lot of it, again, it stems from the damage that he's able to offer in exchange from also having Varus and Ash's ultimate basically always available. And so that is going to be very difficult to sort of go around. Now, I'm of the side or I'm of the school of thought that Aphilios is actually not imbalanced. And instead, the reason that we're seeing him find so much success in pro play and even high level is because a lot of people draft team compositions that are very, very bad into him. And they end up rewarding all the strengths that he's very good at in terms of that hyper damage and the ability to just sort of uh, completely blow away everyone that tries to come into his path. So... When he gets outranged, or when, you know, control mages are inside of the game, or the enemy AD carry is able to outrange him, and they play around things properly, Aphilios does have a pretty bad time, and he's not that monster that, you know, you see in the highlight videos, the 200 years. I also think that Aphilios is a very healthy champion for League of Legends in his current state, and what I mean by that is that even when he is behind, the ability to do the 200 years if the opponents misplay, I think is very exciting aspect of his gameplay that is very healthy for spectating. And I think that it's very good for a high-end uh, MMR. I think it's very good for pro play because it always can sort of keep spectators wondering, is Aphilios going to do what he can do if the opponents mess up, provided he's behind or something? And I think that's an awesome feature that isn't talked about enough from just a, pure ma a purely entertainment and spectator point of view that clearly has ways to be played around. Cassiopeia. Base magic damage decreased. Base stats, 34 to 32. Now, if you remember, Cassiopeia actually got changed where she ended up getting magic resist and she lost some of her other stats, but I actually called it a buff. Seems like they're dialing back the magic resist change a little bit, so I don't think it's going to impact her whatsoever when you're looking to pick Cassiopeia to basically stop and halt your entire opponents in their tracks and then have that mass amount of power coming from her miasma and her ultimate and the enemy team comp having to walk into her, then she's going to be good. If you're blind picking her, you're going to have a really bad time against your opponents. Cassiopeia is not a blind pick champion. It is one of the most trolly things that you can actually do, and so in that regard, I don't think changes like this really impact her. NAR, E attack speed increased. 
Attack speed duration increased. E hop. Attack speed 20 to 60% to 40 to 60% is very big for his hop. That is a lot of value. Attack speed duration 3 seconds to 4 seconds. This is really nice for Nar, but it's not what's gating him from coming back into the meta. He has a lot of very bad matchups in top lane, and even getting this kind of a change where he ends up becoming the same champion still at the later stages of the game doesn't really fix any of the problems that he's having. So I'm wondering why Riot has him on their radar, but they're being so reserved with his changes. Doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I do, I do think he is one of the cutest champions in the game, and I think he has some really nice skins, so I would, I, I would actually like to see him more, but I just think that he's fundamentally bad. Callista, base attack damage growth decreased. Whether she's wrecking havoc in top lane or jumping around in her standard bot lane carry low, Callista is an imposing force in pro play. Uh, attack damage growth, um, 4 to 3.5, so... It's not, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely not the end of the world. She ends up losing a long sword basically at max rank, but I, 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 this is, this is not going to impede her, especially not in the super early stages of the game, which is where she actually finds a lot of her oppression. So yes, while the, the attack damage growth in the later stages of the game can, obviously she, it's, it's, it's a nerf, but the reality is, is that in top lane, if she is being picked, she's still going to do what she was doing before. If she's picked in mid lane, she's still going to be doing what she was doing before. Bot lane, same exact thing. Um, I do, I, I actually, I, I doubt this does anything to her in terms of the Reddit thread that comes out that like changes the champion win rate or play rate and stuff. I mean, maybe it has fluctuations, but I, I am very doubtful it has anything to do with this. This is not that kind of change that I think shifts uh, up or down. Um, you know, outside of variants. Kog'Maw. Q damage ratio increased. R damage uh, ratio increased. This, this is very big. Uh, ca uh, ca caustic? Spittle? 0 0.5 ability power to 0 0.7. And R living artillery? 0 0.25 ability power to 0 0.35 ability power. So Kog'Maw is potentially getting a couple hundred extra damage in the team fights if he ends up going AP. And for those of you guys that don't know, Showmaker, who at one point on the Korean ladder, if you don't know who that is, He's Dom1 Gaming's mid laner. He's also one of the best mid laners in the entire world. He was actually spamming AP Kogma with very, very high success in mid lane. And these changes are really cool because this could mean that it legitimately actually does become a viable pick. And with Kogma also being able to, in theory, be flexed down into bot lane, that's really cool for pro play. It's cool for high MMR. It's also cool for lower MMR because AP Kogma is actually pretty reasonable to pilot. And it's actually a very fun thing. So. I think overall this is really cool to end up having this. Is it going to make him a menace or something? No, not by any means. It's not going to do that. However, the way that Kog'Maw itemizes, he does have enormous AP values because of the items that he ends up purchasing. There's a lot of mages that don't actually get very gross AP values because they end up getting Zhanya's or they get utility magic items, they get like Athenes or they get Ardent, etc, etc. The champions that build Seraph's Embrace and get Deathcap and, and things of that nature that grow to super high AP values, Kog'Maw is one of them, and so these changes mean a lot more to him than they might lean to another champion in mid lane. Like maybe maybe Lissandra who builds Protobelt and then Zhanya's Hourglass and then waits on Oblivion Orb and she doesn't really have the highest amount of AP or something. Lucian, Q ability range increase. Q piercing light, 900 to 1,000. I would like to see them give back Lucian his range that he used to have before on his autos. Um, I think that would be really cool. I think that the ability range coming back, though, 900 to 1,000 is very nice. I like that Riot's at least not abandoning the champion, and they're trying to slowly go about putting him back into the game. Nocturne, bug fix on Umber Blades, cooldown. Passive now always procs against monsters. That's really cool. Um, basic attacks against enemy champions reduce by two seconds. Basic attacks against enemy champions and monsters reduce. Okay, this is very big for Nocturne jungle. And given that Nocturne is also sometimes a flex pick, in AD carry with Senna, uh, fasting him, mid and top lane, this is really nice for Nocturne. Do I think that it's going to mean that he instantly comes into the meta? No, but I think that if the meta ends up ever hitting standstills, people will eventually gravitate to Nocturne, and in those situations, I think that it's nice. Nunu, Q damage and healing ratio increased. Our shield now includes AP ratio. This makes me so happy because he's such a trolly poly champion, and I mean, honestly, Nunu and Willump, two of the most adorable characters here inside of this game it, it really reminds me of like the reindeer poppy skin if you've ever seen that that splash art it's just like it's the most cartoony looking just i don't know um you consume damage ratio 0.5 ability power to 0.65 ability power healing ratio 0.7 ability power to 0.9 on hit that is that's very big 
That is very big for his sustain. This is big for mid and top Nunu more than it is for jungle Nunu, but this opens up new build paths, especially when you look at absolute zero shield ratio, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 bonus health to 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 bonus health plus 1.5 ability power. This is super big. For mid Nunu, if you guys remember when mid Nunu was actually posing some problems on the ladder, this could also be big for support Nunu. If that would end up somehow being a thing, I think that this is actually an area to potentially look at because the, these are really cool ratios. The damage going up by uh, 0.15 and the, the healing for the sustain because Nunu can also itemize in very interesting ways. He can also build Leandre's Torment. I'm just throwing that out there. Anyways, Absolute Zero getting a 1.5 ability power ratio means you will never kill him while he's channeling. It is just going to be pretty much impossible. Um, and given the items that I'm talking about, I'm talking about Leandre's, I'm talking about Proto Belt, the bonus health plus the massive AP ratios here, this is all so big for him. This is really cool. Maybe maybe mid Nunu is potentially going to be viable because his wave clear is so insane and his durability and everything, his sustain, is potentially some value in actually looking at it. Or in passive health and mana items now retain previous health and mana. What? Health and mana items built in the field pride. Uh... This just means that you have to build the armor components before you build the HP components. Which is a little bit awkward. It does impact your ability to bully him in lane, and so Orn is probably now going to shift more into guaranteeing that he's a counterpick when you want to get him. It's not going to be the end of the world when you're building at full HP anyway, but it will affect the the waves 3 through 6. This will definitely impact him. He's going to want to be against physical damage now so that he can just build cloth armor and get chain vest before getting the HP. But outside of that, I suppose it, it doesn't really do anything. I guess it does affect Doron Shield purchase, though, where you start refillable and then build Doron Shield because now you're losing HP. So that little gimmick is no longer going to be possible. I don't think that this kill... Well, this 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 really, really, really hurts Jungle Orn. This hurts Jungle Orn uh, very, very much compared to Top, or top Orn or Mid Orn. But I don't think this kills him. I don't think this kills him. I think that... When I was streaming a little bit earlier, people were overreacting, saying that this would kill him. I don't think it kills him. I mean, it might kill him in pro play, because people will overreact to it, but I think if you really know what you're doing, it's, it, it's not as big as it, it seems. Rakan, W base damage increased later. W grand stance, 70 to 270 to 70 to 200. Wow. Wow, yeah, please slow down there, Riot. Right, base magic resist and attack damage increased. Magic resist 34 to 36. What? Attack damage 56 to 58. This is really big for very good rises. Um, because very good rises will actually auto-attack a enormous amount in laning phase, uh, especially if you end up picking rise up in top lane, and I know what you're probably thinking, you're probably thinking lol 2 AD, but in bully lanes, 2 AD can actually impact things. Maybe this has an interaction with spell flux that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head, where now maybe minions don't live, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe if you auto-attack them like twice or something, you end up getting more, I, I have no idea, uh, to be completely honest with you, but... I think that these buffs are nice, but it's not what's gaining Rise from coming back. And with Orianna making such a resurgence right now in the mid lane, which I'm so happy about. And with other champions like Karma existing and Azir, it's just not really looking very good for Rise to come in in mid lane. And if he is going to come in in top lane, there has to be enough value for him to come in in top lane. And currently, there's there's not really a whole lot of value to come in with Rise top lane. Syndra, Q, uh, Q cost increase. Dark Sphere, 40 to 80 mana to 60 to 80. So what this ends up doing is it means that if Syndra does the cheater recall and ends up coming back into the lane, she is still going to be missing about 80 to 100 mana. But by the time you get it to three points, it's only going to be a 10 difference. So if you have lost chapter and you're managing your mana pool correctly it's not super big especially not if you have blue buff it will be felt you will feel this levels four through like seven four through eight you will feel it everything after that is completely fine um so that, that's pretty much it i think this is a very balanced change i think this is one of the most balanced changes riot's ever done Right, Q cooldown decreased later uh vault breaker 12 to 8 seconds to 12 to 6 seconds this is massive this is very very big 
to get two seconds shaved off at max rank, because this is what she's going to end up maxing first. However, early on, it doesn't really do anything. So when you have it at uh, point 0.1, it doesn't do anything. Um, while you're clearing your jungle, it doesn't really do anything, because you don't get access to these points until after your initial gank. And even inside of the initial ganks, half a second, one second, it's not really doing anything with the way that Vi approaches the gank. It's very big for late game. And mid... Or, or, I'm sorry, it's very big for mid game, where she ends up having the final points inside of it and having two seconds shaved off. Very, very big. Can even actually help her itemize maybe differently because she gets so much help inside of the cooldown department and what the Vault Breaker means to her in mid and late game team fights. This is actually really cool, and I do think this can actually help her better than some of her dittos because Vi doesn't fall off as hard as some of her dittos. And if you don't know what I mean by a ditto, ditto is a term, I think, from fighting game uh, fighting games where champions often or characters often resemble each other and how they conduct themselves. And right now, one of the, the the holy trinity of dittos right now inside of the jungle, I think, is Set, Olaf, and Volibear, where they each do something a little bit different. Olaf, obviously, power farms faster than both of them. Volibear um, ganks better, arguably, than both of them, uh, than Set or Olaf, but you can make a case for Olaf uh, ganking uh, pretty well, too. Uh, Set has the best late game of all three of them. Volibear has probably the best mid game of all three of them. And then Olaf obviously has uh, the most control, most overall early, one could probably argue, um, all things considered. So there's sort of like that triangle that is occurring. Vi fits in with those dittos in terms of how she conducts herself and what she's actively looking for. But Vi does have a little bit more power in the mid and late game because of the nature of her kit. It's not as... It's not as static, um, and a lot of that comes from Vault Breaker. Still probably don't think it's enough um, in order to push her into the meta, but you know what? People might actually try. I'm not, I'm not so totally sure. Yorick, R range for Maiden of the Mist. Okay, no one cares. Uh, Yumi, E cost increased. E zoomies. 100 to 160. 40 to 60 mana, plus 15% max mana. That is very big. If you want Yumi in your comp, you're still going to pick Yumi. This is not going to stop you from picking Yumi, and what this will probably end up doing is it'll probably end up changing Yumi's build. She might end up having to be allocated a little bit of extra gold in order to get certain items or something a little bit sooner, which I think is a weird thing to talk about in itself. Maybe she ends up actually having to incorporate a tier into her build path, which will then stifle her early and mid transition, but Yumi is one of the last remaining true hyper carries in the game. A uh, true hyper carry being that it almost entirely disregards the enemy team composition and it will conduct them or they will conduct themselves for pretty much their how how do, how do I word this? I am I'm I'm brain farting right now and I apologize. They're going to conduct themselves entirely on their own and they don't really care about what their opponent's team or champions are trying to do all that much. Yumi is one of the scariest champions when she gets to three, four, five items if the games ever go that long or if she's just getting very fed or have high AP values due to mage eyes. Um, Yumi is always really cool to see so I hope that people don't uh, just give up on trying to make her work. Runes, Conqueror. We're happy with Conqueror's current standing at Keystone. Okay. Uh, max stack 10 to 12, and then adaptive force per, per stack 2 to 5 to levels 1 to 18 to 1.7 to 4.2. Yeah, I don't think this really um, impacts what Riot is hoping for it to impact. It's going to actually harm more champions and be of almost... I mean, it's going to... Some champions are just going to disregard this change entirely, and then it will harm some champions, but I don't think the ones that they're gunning for. So, at the end of the day, I think that this is um, a bit short-sighted. I know that there was a lot of people that were outspoken about this change and saying that it really missed the mark, but not sure. Guardian is overperforming after its recent buff in consistency, bringing the base shield value down back to uh, before it was buffed, okay? Shield uh, 80 to 200 to... Se okay, no. Nope. 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 How about you just lower a little bit more? Just lower a little bit more, and that would have been that would have been a little bit cool. How about how about one seven? How about we just don't overreact and bring it right back to before? How about look for a middle ground? Why not? Why not? Or whatever. Death Dance, ba uh, base post mitigation damage storing decrease for ranged champions. Post mitigation damage storing twenty percent for ranged champions. Oh yeah, that was wow. Okay, great. Death Dance. I mean, it's a nerf. It is a nerf. I do not think that it's sizable enough to stop the champions that are building it right now from building it. I do not think this is sizable enough. Absolutely not. I, I, 
I would be very surprised if people legitimately stop building it because of this. I, I can't imagine so. Champ select report and mute testing. Thank you. Champ select uh, metering blocks messages from the muted player in champ select and the mute carries over in game. For now, champ select reporting is only in place to collect data. After the experiment ends, we'll use that data to plan out further investment in this type of penalty system. This is a little bit scary for people that want to try, uh, or not try new champions, but if they play unorthodox things, even if they're successful with it, that could be a little bit scary. And what I mean by that is, imagine you run into a one trick that has a 55% win rate or a 54% win rate over 500 games, and they do something like 80 new new top lane. Um, and they're steadily and slowly climbing or something like that, that is where, I guess, stuff does get a little bit weird if the other four players decide to just report that person. Um, I think that people would liken this to some of the stuff that has been controversial in the past with certain people um, that were trying to climb the ladder with unorthodox and Johnny-esque builds and stuff, but I think that if you really go and look at the context surrounding those cases, there was more to the story than just that explanation. Um, okay, upcoming skins and chromas. Okay, let's get to this last, so I'm going to just do a quick recap, as always, on what I think that it means for solo queue and pro play. Um, Aphilios, I think it will do nothing, really, for competitive, or, I mean, it will do something for competitive, but I think that for solo queue, it, it, yeah, or, it'll do less for competitive than it will for solo queue, I'm sorry, the invert. For solo queue, this is much bigger, because solo queue has a lot more randomness and a lot less control, and so I think the Moonlight Vigil change is going to be much bigger, and then also the random barons and, and other stuff like that, I guess it can be definitely different. Cassiopeia doesn't really change a whole lot, Nar doesn't change a whole lot, Callista doesn't change a whole lot. Kog'Maw, very, very, very big if you do play AP Kog'Maw in mid or, you know... Yeah, if you just play AP Kog'Maw, it is very nice. I guess if you build Gwinsu's, this even helps the, the on-hit Kog'Maw a very, very little bit. Uh, but I, I really like the changes no matter what, so I think it's very, very, very cool. Um, Lucian doesn't really do anything. Nocturne potentially does something, but I don't imagine that it's going to do it right now in the, the meta's current state. Um, however, it is very big for Nocturne jungle inside of Solo Queue. Nunu might be the biggest change of the patch, because I'm going to disregard Orin, because it's just going to require people to be more uh, cognizant of when they're picking him and what lanes he's going to be going into, and then how to actually itemize, because a lot of people actually lose to Shop Kilder lose to shopkeeper what when playing orn um and it's still a very very sad thing because we are you know we're halfway done with the year and there has been more than enough examples and arguments and shown uh proper itemization build path on orn to it, it's just very scary that it's still happening but anyways nunu i think is one of the biggest change I, I think nunu is actually the biggest change of the entire patch Nunu, Nunu is the biggest in terms of how exciting it can potentially be for mid. Uh, we'll see what like Nunu one tricks that actually play mid end up doing or Nunu support. Obviously, it's also good for Nunu jungle um, because maybe it can open up some more different build paths. But uh, overall, I think it's not a nice change. I I'm excited to see what it means for mid Nunu. Uh, Syndra, Q Dark Sphere, 42, yeah, the Syndra doesn't really, uh, change anything, this will impact solo queue a lot more than competitive, um, because competitive is more about, like, controlling your lanes correctly, and then playing around certain item breakpoints, in which case, she will make it past the, the problematic phase of the, the rankings in the Q Sphere. Uh, Rise Change, not big enough. Uh, Vi is very, very, very big for solo queue, also very big for competitive. York, um, doesn't really matter. Yumi, very, very big for competitive. I think less important for solo queue, as weird as that sounds. And then, obviously, I don't really care about this stuff all that much. All right, let's get into the skins. So, okay. Um, yeah, I don't really... Uh, actually, I, this might be the first time I just skipped the skins. I have no idea. Um, I don't really like any of the chromas here. This kind of looks like Tarek found himself with a carrot stick. I don't know why. It just really, really... <gasps> I mean, this is the coolest skin. This is actually the coolest skin. What is going on here? Uh, okay. Um, okay, the cannon, the cannon skin is really cool, too. Wow, this looks like Alvin and the Chipmunks. I, I don't know why I immediately thought of Alvin and the Chipmunks. Um, Surgeon Shen Chroma. I mean, these are kind of cool, but none of them really stand out to me. Th these just seem like very, very bland chromas. Um, I don't, I don't really know what to think about here. I, none of these really appeal to me. I think the base skin is still the best. Maybe you can make an argument for this one right here. Um, but overall, not very much. Ooh, Nurse Akali chromas are looking pretty good, but still, I mean, you just want to, you just want to pick Prestige Edition Nurse Akali. 
Um, pool Party Syndra doesn't really look that cool to me. I would still probably pick either her Atlantean skin or Snow Day. Pool Party Talia, not really doing it for me either. And Pool Party Oriana. I, I think the Pool Party Oriana one looks kind of cool. She looks like she's from, like, a Renaissance fair or something. Um, yeah, the Splat Hearts for the skins. I mean, Heimerdinger is obviously the boss. This Poro is also... This Poro is getting a W, honestly. Right now, this guy, he's getting a W. Absolutely getting a W. And also, look at his look at his coconut drink. You guys are actually all jealous of him right now. Um, Jarvan is... I mean, he looks like he's asleep at the wheel. I, I Honestly, I have no idea what is even going on here to be completely honest with you. Uh, and, okay, I'm not sure that Robot should be in water, but I guess she's just been, you know, I mean, she's really taking care of herself. Doesn't look like there is any other hidden uh, Easter eggs in the splash art whatsoever. This thing looks like it's from Mario. You remember, uh, is it Chomp Chomp or is it Gromp? I, I, Gromp Gromp? Chomp Chomp? I don't actually remember. Is that Lulu right there? That might be Lulu. She might be, I mean, she might be drowning. You know, she might be drowning. I have no idea. And that's pretty much it for the Patreon Downs. I hope you guys enjoyed it. See you later. Bye.